still feeling tired? Feeling good after the break? Yes, no, maybe. I should run a machine learning model to find out. All right, welcome, welcome everyone. So what we'll do is uh, today's session is uh, that on automated uh, feature engineering. So both Sagar and I uh, would be taking you through that uh, how we do automated feature engineering. We'll take a use case. Uh, it's a life sciences use case uh, that Sagar will uh, take us through. And then we are not going to stop there. We're also going to spend some more time in kind of suggesting how do you take these models once they have been built into productization. So we're also going to spend uh, some time there. So that's the, the broad, broad uh, focus that we have for today, uh, as you can see you know, in the agenda that we are creating here. A little bit about ZS. Uh, we are also one of our sponsors here. Uh, it's always good to work with AIM and uh, the MLDS community. And coming back to, 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 to Bangalore. Uh, it's a professional services firm. We help our customers through consulting, operations, technology to get their products much easily to their own customers. So the, broadly, that's what uh, ZS does. Uh, we are close to around 23 offices globally. In India, we're in three places, uh, Gurgaon, Pune, and in, in Bangalore as well. So, so, so that's a little bit about uh, the, all the kind of work we do, uh, spreading all the way from uh, commercial excellence to R&D to sales to marketing and everything in between. Uh, can we have a video, please? We just wanted to give a glimpse of uh, what we do with AI uh, at ZS. small sneak preview of uh, all the things that we do. I mean, you might have seen you know, the, the glimpses of sales and marketing. You might have seen uh, glimpses of uh, um, the factoring. You might have seen the forecasting and so forth. It's a very quick, quick sneak peek. We wanted to keep it short, uh, at least for this session. Uh, and to take you forward a little more deeper in terms of kind of work we do and the actual use case, uh, let me call upon uh, Sagar. Sagar, please. Thank you, Vishik. So we have a center of excellence in Bangalore. We just opened it last year. And so uh, out of the many things that we do uh, is, you know, apart from focusing on customer problems, is having a lab kind of set up, uh, organizing competitions and challenges for recruiting the best talent, uh, many, many data partnerships in order to help us build solutions more quickly. And of course, things around compute, uh, thought leadership, and so on and so forth. So a lot of different things we do as part of the center of excellence concept. Uh, now, what do we do as part of advanced data science? So three main things. So first is we do a lot of unstructured data mining. Uh, so we've worked a lot with structured data in the 30 years of our existence, but as unstructured data is becoming more and more central to the problems today. So core area for us to make sense and understand what is really unstructured data convey to us. So ingesting it uh, via techniques of speech recognition, computer vision, natural language processing, uh, so on and so forth. Once we have the data in hand, the focus is to use machine learning in order to see what could we do with it, you know? How could we reason with it? How can we plan with it, you know? And this involves things around inference, prediction, and optimization, right? And we use a lot of techniques here, starting from, uh, you know, unsupervised learning to, say, reinforcement learning and deep learning. Once we have the data figured out, we have a model built. Uh, you know, we just don't stop there. We actively work with our customers to embed it so that they can act upon the insight that is coming out of it, right? And that's where the embedded intelligence or uh, different kind of platforms come in. What we're going to cover is one such example of a tool that we built in order to make sure that customers can act on insights coming out of real world data. All right. So what do business teams really need from machine learning teams inside the organization. Any guesses? Any one-liners? What do business teams need from machine learning teams inside organizations? Sorry? Help make decisions, okay. 
insights okay what else sorry right solution okay increase sales you hit the okay good all right so all of it so one is you know make sense of multi dimensional data uh, the data landscape is changing every day as you might know right um apparently more data is going to be generated in 2020 than all the 18 years combined and i hear quotes like this every year and so it means new sources of data ever increasing volume even the dimension of the data is increasing right you can get more and more granular in how you capture customer attributes next how do we get to actionable insights early or quickly now if it might be right business needs insights almost in real time now real time can mean different things for different domains right uh, in case of e-commerce for instance it might mean hours or even minutes in case of healthcare where we predominantly work it might mean say days so it really depends so but uh, the core philosophy is get the results quickly and get results that we can act upon not something theoretical of course uh, interpretive models now this is debatable there are cases where we really don't need uh, interpretability as much as accuracy but as a uh, generally i think it's good to have things that we can understand right so if you're giving something to business it's important for them to understand what are the drivers at play so they can make decisions accordingly so interpretive models is the other thing right and the last, of course, is that, you know, it should be easy to move to production. Uh, you know, the Netflix Kaggle challenge comes to mind. Netflix hosted a challenge on Kaggle, and they got a super accurate model on the top. Uh, and they, the, the, the person who built it got a reward of a million dollars. And then Netflix took it, tried to productionize it, figured out a lot of challenges with it. There's nothing they could do with it, right? So then actually went back, they picked the second or the third winner, Gave him another million dollars, so he could actually productionize the model. So deploying models to production is a very, very important aspect, and I think these are the kind of things we need to take care of uh, as machine learning teams when we're building models. I think these are the aspects that we need to keep in mind. Okay. All right. So what does the typical data science process look like today? Uh, we do a lot of data prep, and then we do a lot of feature engineering. We do handcrafted feature engineering. We rely upon our knowledge, we rely upon research, and then we go and build our model, uh, use techniques like gradient boosting, decision trees, right? And of course, there's an inference pipeline that is action related to inference, right? What is the challenge with it? So this is a very orthodox way of doing things. This takes, this might take weeks, right? So in the cases where we have worked with our customers, the typical way we used to do things, it used to take us about three or four weeks. It has even taken us months to get uh, feature engineering right. Now, you might be lucky, you might get the feature engineering right at the first instance itself, but that's just being lucky. But usually, you know, we had to spend a lot of time in order to comb through the feature set, figure out what are the right predictors, and then finally deploy it to a model, right? So how do we really, uh, you know, shorten this time? Because if you have to get results very quickly, in an agile manner, you can't spend an inordinate amount of time on feature engineering. It's especially true of uh, industries such as uh, say e-commerce, retail, and so on and so forth, right? Your time to insight is always shrinking. So that's where we build this tool, Plug and Predict. The idea is that you know we automate the feature engineering, selection, and modeling part of it entirely, right? Uh, and the way it works is you know uh, we have operators at the core that are able to construct all the possible features that exist, and then use genetic algorithms, it's a class of evolutionary algorithms, in order to uh, evaluate what is the best feature set possible. Okay? Now, uh, let me just illustrate with an example what are the kind of challenges we face. Why do we need uh, automated feature engineering? So we work with a lot with healthcare. I specifically work a lot with patient-level data. That is what the real-world data tag should for. So real-world data actually means in the context of healthcare, anything to do with patient-level data. Now, one challenge with patient-level data is the number of uh, dimension does it has. Okay, and what I'm going to show you is information collected for a, from a patient who is probably suffering from prostate cancer. Okay, so this is just a small snapshot of the kind of information that we have. He made an office visit to a doctor, got diagnosed. 
made a further visit to a different center perhaps, got a procedure done, started a treatment, maybe for a different disease because the disease is not correctly diagnosed. He might also got diagnosed with a comorbidity or an adverse event while taking the drug, so on and so forth. Right? And then you could do a lot of tests. Right? Now, in general, we have seen for a given customer, or sorry, a given patient, we capture up to about 40 or 50 different kind of unique events every year. 50 different unique events. And the way it's represented in the database in healthcare is, you get, got this codes called ICD-9 or ICD-10 codes. How many of you are aware of this? ICD-10? Okay, good. We also have procedure codes, then we also have drug codes, right? So a lot of different information that is collected for a given patient, all right? Now this is okay. Uh, if I have information for a single patient and say I'm trying to figure out what could be the probability of him, uh, you know, moving to the next line or say getting diagnosed with a new disease, I could probably use a risk calculator. I can make an intelligent judgment based on what I've seen so forth, right? But what happens when you have, say, millions of patients or even thousands of patients, right? The problem becomes challenging, right? It's difficult to scale feature engineering. I can construct features of, say, 100 patients but the moment the scale becomes a thousand, ten thousand, or a million, it becomes more and more challenging for me, right? The amount of time that I have to spend to get to the most accurate features just keeps on increasing, right? And the way we used to do it was, you know, we used to rely a lot on our knowledge, but we realized the knowledge also comes short somewhere. This is another example. This is a live example, you know, this is what we call as a patient journey. Uh, so in this case, the patient is actually suffering from a metastatic cancer event. And so there are a lot of uh, dimensions or information captured about this patient, right? He goes to a doctor, doctor makes some basic diagnosis test, right? He visits an oncologist, oncologist prescribes something, then he goes chemo, he goes surgery, and surgery, he visits pharmacy, so on and so forth. So you can see a lot of rich information, right? All right. What does it mean in terms of feature editing? So I said it's challenging to scale, right? But why is it challenging? So for those of you who are aware of ICD-9 and 910 codes, the procedure code and so on and so forth, you could add an, uh, so I think there are about uh, 50 or 60 different time, uh, thousand kinds of granular ICD-9, 10 and procedure codes. If you extract them up, you have about 3,000 odd categories and these capture uh, the patient's, uh, you know, prescription, procedure, diagnosis information. Okay, so you have about 3,000 different type of categories that can represent patient events. So in case of cancer, you might want to go back, say, three years, right? And I want to want look at uh, weekly data, so 50, 20 to 3. And there are, say, about uh, six or seven different types of features that I can create, right? So the typical features that we create is, you know, how frequently he had a test. Uh, you know, is his lab instance decreasing? You know, is his um, HB even c increasing? is his ASTLT increasing and so on and so forth, right? So there are about uh, six different type of features. Now if you combine all of this, this is about three million features. And this is under stating it because this is just the univariate paradigm of it, right? The moment I try to uh, create combinations of these features, this will immediately blow up. In fact, I have categories there. If I go down to code level, this automatically increase by a factor of 10 or 20. So three million features, how do I really comb it? Now, what do we do? We typically tend to stick with features that we know, or oh, something that has been uncovered in research already. But for you to make a very objective assessment, you should idly go through all the three million features. Right? So how do we do that? So in Plug and Predict, the way we do it is, uh, the first aspect is, of course, feature construction. So I need to be sure that I can construct all the possible three million features that exist. And so the way I do it is using what we call as operators. Okay, now the naming might differ from, uh, you know, machine learning developer to machine learning developer, but we call it as operators. So I talked about the time component, so you could vary the time component. You could go at a day level, week level, month level, year level, and so on and so forth. Uh, so an operator for that. Then you have an event type, whether the patient suffered a diagnostic event, whether he had a lab test, whether he has a procedure, so on and so forth. And then, of course, the, uh, the value of the attribute itself. What is the value of the lab test? Um, what are the costs associated with this procedure? And, of course, 
the finally the type of the feature itself. Or did he have a recent doctor visit? Uh, did he frequently was he vi frequently visiting a certain doctor for a certain kind of test? Uh, so on and so forth. So the first thing is constructing the entire feature space using this approach. Then the core of the algorithm is use genetic algorithms in order to comb the feature set. So this is a, so this is a very high level idea of how it's done. There are of course nuances associated with it. Uh, we'll skim through in the interest of time. The core idea is that, you know, start with a random set of select features. In the example that I've shown, it's about 100. Rank it based on a matrix called as odds ratio. Now, odds ratio is nothing but a reflection of how often a patient having that feature, you know, has a particular kind of outcome, okay? That's the idea of it. So see an example below. I start with, say, a feature called as frequency of hypertension diagnosis in the last five months, so 150 days. Okay, I get the first set of 100 features, I rank it based on the odds ratio. I select the top 10, 20, what it matters for your given problem. In our case, we decided it's going to be 15. Then we select, you know, mutate it continuously, right? Second generation, third generation, so on and so forth until we cover a specified number of uh, generations. So the reason why we have indicated 100 generations here is we determine that uh, the genetic algorithm is able to comb nearly all the 3 million feature set within those set number of generations. Okay? So in this case, the first mutation of the feature can be, don't look at 150 days prior to the anchor event, look at 250 days, right? And so on and so forth until you get to the last generation itself, and then you get the fittest set of features. So the core concept is mutation and reproduction in order for you to scan the entire feature space possible and select the fittest features. So at the end of it, you actually were, have a feature known as number of days since the patient had a last hypertension diagnosis. And of course, once you have the features available, right, uh, then you just use a, uh, then in our case, we use a gradient boost model. Uh, we could also use a light gradient boosting machine or something else in order to run a basic classification algorithm. An example of what we call as mutation. So in this case, say we start with, say, trend of BMI values in the recent 16 months. Uh, you know, we pass it through the uh, generic algorithm. Maybe, you know, it's not recent six months. Recent two months is what matters. Or you know what? Even BMI does not matter, just the weight matters. So the trend of weight in the recent two months is what matters. So let's uh, end with it. Our case, right? You might want to do, say, have a feature known as number of days since the last prescription was made by a cardiovascular specialist. You know, GA changed it to, say, internal medicine specialist. Now, that is not the fittest feature. You ended up with something known as frequency of the prescription by an internal medicine specialist in the last 20 days. So these are the kind of mutations that happen throughout. Uh, now, there are many examples of it, but just to give a sense of uh, what happens. All right. Hopefully, that gives you a good idea of what plug-in predict is. Uh, now, I give you an example of uh, patient-level databases because that's what I work with. but the construct is applicable to any kind of problem that involves longitudinal customer data, right? So it might be applicable to retail, e-commerce, um, you know, any industry that you can think of where we have longitudinal customer data. The idea is though not to just do automated feature discovery, the idea is really to have the knowledge worker or the analyst a tool that can aid in feature discovery. So we're not saying we're just going to automate and keep the human out of the loop. The idea is that, you know, even deep domain specialists can use this tool in order to figure out newer features or newer insights from the data. So what do we see in terms of impact? So what have you seen across the experiments that we conducted in the last uh, one year or so? Uh, so you cut down feature engineering time from say four or five weeks to a week. So that's almost 60%. We're actually trying to cut down into days. Um, of course, because you don't need to spend so much effort, you really don't need so many people. I know this is uh, a little uh, contestable, but nevertheless, what we figured out. And of course, because you're now doing objective feature discovery, right? You're not biased by human knowledge. Your accuracy might go up to, say, 10 to 20 percent, okay, from the baseline, right? Uh, so this really is the promise of this uh, tool. So once you do objective feature discovery using GA, and these are the kind of outcomes that you get, right? So as I mentioned, it's applicable to a broad class of industries. Uh, Non-healthcare, you could look at, say, things like what are the drivers of Salesforce uh, rep attrition? Um, you know, who's going to uh, leave the organization? 
figuring out you know if there is a manufacturing batch at the risk of low yield uh, figuring out drivers of cart abandonment and customer churn you know and you could do all of this very very quickly and in healthcare of course you could do a lot of things starting from say disease onset uh, treatment initiation progression hospital readmissions uh, and also in r and d you know figuring out what are the trial sites that are going to drop off because of non performance okay all right i just overshoot my mandate so handing up so this is the science behind the uh, algorithm for automated feature discovery now handing over to abhishek to speak out the production aspects of it thank you thank you thank you sir so ho hope that gave a glimpse of uh, how do we go about automating feature engineering which is a very very important aspect of any model development now to to bring it back into a little bit of the perspective of uh, what i often call it is the yin and the yang uh, you have the science and the engineering you have to think about how do you create the best model but then you also have to ensure how do you take it to production and and in future also into uh, product the product uh, so that can be used by multiple clients per se if you think about what do we talk about predominantly when we do talk about model development you to talk about things like the business problem we have to solve what are the hypotheses i have to create where i'm going to get my data from what features i have to create what is my hyperparameters how i'm going to go to that and on the other side when you get into engineering you start talking about how would do performance tuning how would i do deployment how would i do ab testing and so forth so that's that's what we are going to talk talk about but one key important thing to kind of you know note note here is the life cycle which is highlighted in the below that you build the model you test the model you deploy and you of course have to validate validate which is from a business validation standpoint is my model actually working the example of netflix that saga just uh, mentioned is a case in point we have to make sure that it's actually work when it's live in production and of course you might have to retrain uh, you might have to make changes and of course once you are 100% sure you can of course move into the other step of uh, productizing productizing the model let's start off with the deployment so with sagar and our advanced data science team they have created this great model uh, but now of course we have to deploy it so our clients can use it now in this case we have taken a very simplistic example uh, we are a amazon life sciences uh, partner so i've used uh, aws as examples but you can use any of the cloud providers we started putting in the data in s3 we started uh, putting in the, our model model in sagemaker which is uh, amazon's uh, you know ai ml platform and uh, we also use the mr to leverage the distributed computing and finally the, the all of this then gives you the results or the inferences which you can use the jupyter notebook r shiny web and and so forth you can use any of them to display but you have to go ahead and deploy and that's the stack we used data s3 your compute which is mr and of course sagemaker and then of course uh, the the delivery of the results which could be any of these tools to to showcase your inferences now again key key thing to kind of note note here that business validation is very very important so again i can't say enough that uh, people as, as we create create one of the best models but unless it is going to work in the real life it's it's not not uh, like you know best best uh, till it um, the, it tests the water now <clears throat> think about if we have validated that this model has been product moved into production it has been validated through business that it is giving me real results uh, i think one example we heard how do we uplift sales so of course it is uplifting sales but how do i go ahead and now productize it so that it moves from just one in this case as a project to it can support many 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 of them and so forth so first thing you have to think through is that of generalization now it's a very critical step which uh, many many people kind of usually miss when they are thinking of creating the model hey, it's working in production now it's awesome let me just make it into a product and assume that it's going to work for everyone now you have to first define when you say it's going to work for everyone what does it mean because uh, if you look at the use cases across clients they definitely change there are nuances that you have to think through the business models are slightly different the end customers uh, have different changes so the assumption that one model is going to work for every everyone definitely definitely does not hold true so think through how you're going to define the generalization and that could mean changes to the model itself that could mean changes to your features that could mean changes to to the kind of data sets that you used to train and so forth but it's a very important step to kind of kind of remember next is that of code refactoring so you have received the code and uh, our data scientists uh, are great great at creating these big big models and uh, that's what they should be doing you know they should be identifying business problems and solving solving the big challenges and so forth uh, but uh, more often than not we have seen that their mindset is more towards solving the problem the science behind it versus how do i scale 
How do I make sure it's the best engineered model that could be deployed and so forth? Now, it's not a question of skill set. It's more of a question of mindset, where their more focus is on solving the business problems and using the best of the models and, and the, the advances in, in data science that is out there. But then when you look at inside the code, there's a huge opportunity to kind of improve upon it, a huge, huge opportunity. A few examples could be even simple things like dead code. Or you look at, uh, how do you look at, uh, like, you know, you, you have these uh, uh, loops that we have. How can you change some of those loops and, and redundant loops and in intensive loops? Or how do you introduce concepts like parallelization to kind of improve upon the execution and so forth? So those are, again, some good examples that you have to look at code refactoring. The other important one is that of architectural overhaul. Now, again, in this case, we're talking about productizing. We are talking about making sure that it works across multiple, multiple clients, multiple use cases, and that's why this is what is already out there. Please go ahead and leverage, which is, which is something out there. Why would you reinvent the wheel? So you spend most of your time on focusing on the problem versus building some of these tech stack and so on. Now, many of these providers have come up with very advanced APIs as well. You know, Lex, Poly, you know, Medical, uh, again, using again Amazon examples as, as we are partners with them, are very good examples. If I have already figured out uh, how to use that, I would rather improve upon that and solve business problems versus trying to go, go after them. Now, of course, if your business itself is in that domain, I mean, that's a different question. But the point here is leverage, which is out there. Uh, other good example, like let's say of IBM, when you have uh, the Watson provider which is coming in, they have created many, many of these APIs which are solving uh, specific problem statements. Again, no need to create it from scratch. And last and not the least, the idea is to also look at industry-specific providers. Now, I've used example from, uh, from ZS, in which case uh, we have created some of these assets, we have created some of these platforms to help us elevate what our data scientists are doing, what our business analysts are doing, what our consulting folks are doing, so that they don't have to worry about it from scratch. And the key takeaway from here is that if you're working in a niche domain, if you're working in where the, the, the domain knowledge and expertise matters a lot, lot, try to look for solutions which are industry leading where people have codified this domain and expertise so you can leverage those. Uh, one, one sort of module that I can highlight here is that of algorithm as a service. We came up with this module to say, hey, we've created this model. How do we create it in a way that people can just access it as, as an API call? And what we have done is uh, we have created it on top of SageMaker. So that's where that domain richness of building on top of uh, cloud providers. We have created just three APIs. You can just upload your model. You can go ahead and uh, train your model. And then you can predict. Just with these three APIs, with the parameters that you pass, you're able to you know, create a service layer in front of any of your models. So again, try to look for these industry-specific uh, uh, providers and, uh, and assets and, and platforms that are out there. And don't look for very, very, he very heavy ones. Like, for example, assets. We have created assets which are just uh, helping us with uh, quick infrastructure uh, boot up. You, know, you don't have to wait for cold starts every time. Just click a script, and it takes care of it. You take care of your pipeline management and so on. That's one extreme, which is a smaller uh, quick wins. And then the larger one, of course, with the platforms that you can solve, like, for example, Revo here. So that's uh, all we had. Uh, again, happy to take some questions. Uh, we have close to two to three minutes. Yeah, please. Mm -hmm. Creation. Now, uh, I remember that genetic algorithm is a stochastic operational search, where exactly you cannot give the guarantee if features are dynamically changing, because your weight to that uh, stochastic value will keep on change. How will uh, define that these are the important features uh, when the features are passing from millions of features are passing through the, uh, stochastic process? Okay. So as I mentioned, I know what we're trying to do is. Uh, we recognize that problem, right? So the idea was that scan the feature set, no, the scan the feature set as much to the extent possible. So in this case, what we're able to do is we're able to scan about 95% of the species space. So I'm pretty sure that, you know, uh, from the experience that we've done, we start with a seed set of features. It can be features that you've used in the past. The ones that are going to come out of it, the odds are necessarily going to be higher, going from generation one to generation 100. And that's how we are pretty sure that what I end up with is not going to be uh, worse of than what I already have. So the odds is always going to improve generation to generation. So combining this with the fact that I'm able to scan the entire feature space, that's how I'm able to ensure that what I get is 
actually close to optimal. But, but one more thing here, next question is like, if we'll uh, let feature one and feature two, there are some association between feature and feature two. That's true, yeah. And which lead to A intersection B, yeah. would be uh, genetic operation will give higher accuracy, whereas yeah. e exactly it is not higher accuracy. That's true, yes. There so, could be instances like that, yes, we recognize, and that's why I said, there are a lot of nuances behind it, okay. and we did consider, so this is the one, and the other one is making sure that there's no overfitting because there might be, po so in the case of healthcare database, right, uh, we have instances where we have cost, yeah. and we have uh, information like uh, event, diagnosis event. So diagnosis event is actually a categorical variable. Cost is a numeric variable. It's possible that it hooks on to cost because the variability in cost is higher <coughs> compared to the variability in diagnosis. So that might lead to, say, cost being becoming, uh, you know, getting picked up as an important feature. Uh, but that we have to, so we actually ensure that, you know, these kind of things don't happen. A feature is not just picking up, picking up, picked up because there's overfitting. We also take into account uh, things like leakage, et cetera, while we are actually uh, picking features from generation to generation. So one more last question, like uh, when you mentioned like a uh, overheating now for example uh, let crossover right when you do two feature mutation and crossover that crossover value is overheating now how will handle that so every time as I said right uh, once I get the uh, once I get the odds ratio if I'm getting an overfit value I also have a bit of memory along with me okay. so that's what I not mentioned okay. so okay. I take into account the memory in order to make sure that I'm not picking up features that are giving me indication of overfitting in the past as well. Okay. So, Thank you. yeah, I highlighted a lot about the fact that how it works, but there are nuances that you mentioned that have to be taken care of. Overfitting, leakage, etc. Uh, hi, I have a question here. So, yes. um, have there been any instances in, from your work where uh, the features that you have identified that the other, um, you know, the domain experts did not know and the features yeah, that you have identified and... Good, yeah, good question. So this is one instance that I, rec I recollect. I think this ha just happened three months back. So working in order to identify what are the drivers of uh, liver disease. I'm not sure how many of you are aware of NASH. John. Not John NASH. Okay. Uh, there's a disease called NASH. Hmm. Star, you know, stands for non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. So liver enlarges, right? Even if you don't consume alcohol, that's the bad part of it. And it's asymptomatic. You don't recognize it until it, uh, it's in the last stage. There is no drug for it. And so we were working with this client in order to figure out what are the drivers of somebody fast, you know, doing a fast progression to NASH. So one, of course, one way is uh, because these clinical guys go and comb through the literature, figure out what are the features of interest, and we did that. We said, let's, let's use this, let's see what comes up. And we got a couple of variables that were not, uh, not so interesting, but there are others that were very interesting. So things like, uh, so typical variables that are used in case of uh, Fast progression is things like your AST, LT. There's a standard uh, test that are done in any kind of primary care exams. What we found out was there are things like monocyte percentage in your blood. It's increasing over a period of about 18 months. And this happens six months prior to you getting NASH. There's one more which talks about uh, the value of bicarbonate in your blood. So these are the kind of features that they hadn't thought about, and this is what came up as something novel and interesting to them. Okay, this is one example. There are a lot of other examples where we discuss something novel, and that is the part I did not highlight. I just highlighted the efficiency part of it. There is an efficacy part of it because now you're very objective in trying to search the entire feature space of interest. Thank you. Yeah, well, one thing worth adding there is that's the power when we say automated feature engineering in this case, that you know, you're allowing it uh, scanning through the entire universe versus just going ahead with your own gut feeling about which features based on our domain experience. Because then the system is going through all these mutations and combinations, and then it's coming up and saying, you know, this is the best one you should go for. And then again, the human in the loop comes in, closes the loop to say, does this still make sense? Yeah. Or you want to repeat the process? Yeah, and I just want to highlight the fact, right? It's not like, oh, I override the clinical experts. The clinical expert is still going to have a look at the features. That's very important. Uh, this is just a tool to augment your own feature engineering selection paradigm. Hi, uh, I have a question uh, regarding your slide on the path to productionization. Mm -hmm. okay. You had uh, uh, deployment first, mm -hmm. automated deployments, 
followed by the A-B testing. Mm -hmm. And what is the reason for having the deployment and shouldn't it be vice versa to have the testing first and the deployments? Yeah. No, no, good point. So in this case, what I was talking about is you have two models, which you have, you have reservoir level of comfort that they are going to work. In that case, you have to deploy to production first for it to work on live data. So that's what I meant. You have to deploy to production first so you know you can test it for two different types of customers or randomly. But of course, uh, if you're referring to A-B testing from a machine learning, learning standpoint with the model development is itself, is, I'm not suggesting that. That, of course, has to happen while the model development itself is taking place. Does that make sense? Okay. Thanking our speakers for that wonderful session. Uh, we'll conclude it uh, because we have lunch next and then the next session. But I'm sure our speakers will uh, be happy to take questions offline. Yes. Yeah. Is that for okay? Sure. So if yeah. you have further questions, you can uh, talk to them offline. Thank, Thank you so you. much and we'll see you back at 1.50 as we uh, commence our next session. Thank you.